be somewhat similar to the sermonette today. Uh, you know, all of us have our stories to tell, don't we, over the last uh, several months and the things that we've experienced, uh, COVID-19 related, other issues that have absolutely nothing to do with, with that, but um, some, some things that are uh, connected with that. But we all have our, our stories to tell in the way that the situation has impacted us uh, individually or in particular. These situations in which we find ourselves, uh, situations for which we can't necessarily prepare. You know, you think about it, how could we have prepared for this? How could we have really prepared for what we, what we had uh, happened to us here? And as the sermonette talked about, the, the confusion that, that was all around us. Uh, one of the things that, that I found, at least with, with going through what we've gone through recently here in the United States of America, uh, in our particular experience here in, in North, North Texas, it's, it's created opportunities for us as a family, I think for, for all of us here, uh, to, to better see ourselves, to better see ourselves in, in how we view life, in how we view what's, what's really important in life. Uh, the, the, the kind of what really matters to us, what, what really should matter to us. And as, as, as we marvel in what's going on in the world around us, as we just think about all that, all the things that we see going on right now, uh, the turmoil, the upheaval, as, as Mr. Greider talked about, the elements of human nature and the way they're impacting uh, all, all of uh, different attributes of, of society, these attributes of the evil one that's churning in the moods and attitudes through every fabric of society. You know, and, and speaking of, of marveling, sometimes I marvel at how this whole thing has not completely come unraveled by now. You know, how many of, you, of us have, have said uh, this, as, as I've heard over and over many times over the last I don't know, 30, 40, 50 years, it seemed, here it goes, it seems like God is, is still, he's still got this band around things, and he's, he's not letting that band snap yet. You know, it just hasn't snapped, but it's, it's, it's like it's ready to snap, and we think, how come, how come it hasn't snapped? Because so many different things are going on, so many different tensions are building, and elements that could trigger this or trigger that to, to send us down that road of prophecy that we know about. The, the, the prophecy that we see that speaks ultimately to the return of Christ, which is our next holy day. So, you know, I think as God's people, sometimes we ask, well, well why? If he is holding it back, why? why? Why has it not just completely come unraveled? What's the reason for that? Why hasn't God, in a sense, let it go? Let it go and, and start to, uh, well, not that he isn't already, uh, allowing things to become in, increasingly and increasingly uh, confusing. But why hasn't God just let it go? Because we know that when it happens, it's going to happen very quickly. Boom, 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 boom. And here we are uh, at the time. I, I don't think we know why, but we can hypothesize. We can offer several hypotheses, several hypotheses uh, about it on, on why, what, what reasons this might be. I, I've thought of several. You may think of some. I'll, I'll go through a few here uh, at, as we begin the message. Why hasn't God completely let it go yet? Because it is, it is bad out there. One, one reason uh, that, that I, I sometimes wonder is, is I think of our Ephraim and Manasseh set up here. We're, we're Manasseh, that single nation that's been blessed so incredibly. And, and we think of, when we think of the blessings that have happened to this country, what, where this country has, has achieved the dominance that it has economically, financially, as an, as an influencer of the world, you know, basically as, as you know, it demonstrated its power in, in assisting in World, I, world War I. But World War II, after World War II uh, finished, America clearly was perceived as the dominant nation 
in what, uh, in what it was able to do. And then we think of the past 75 years, and this, this is basically our lifetime. Our lifetime. We, have, we have a few folks here, and, and I, I think of in Sherman, that are over that age, but most of our lives, really, once we've you know, had, had minds to think or sharp enough to think, most of our lives have been during this time where the United States has been the most powerful nation in the world. That, that's what we've lived. That's what we've, that's, that's what we've come to understand as the baseline. And I, I wonder sometimes uh, with that, is, is that with, with the blessings that, that we've received, as, as we see these things that happen around us, and wow, this is bad, or wow, this is, this is bad, or this is bad, that uh, sometimes I, I wonder if God is, is helping us see that we don't have a clue about what it's like to be really, really in a bad state. Our, our, our blessing level has been so high to, to step down from that a little bit with some of the challenges that we've faced as a nation. Nowhere near, doesn't even scratch the surface of, of many of these nations and what they live every day in the best of their worlds. Uh, I, I wonder on that. Uh, a member just wrote me, uh, wrote me just last night and thinking about what's going on now in our country and uh, all the, the challenges that our country is facing on so many different levels. And he wrote this, he said, this pandemic is child's play compared to what's coming in the great tribulation up until the angel pours out the last bowl. And, and to some degree it is. I think, I think, it, I think it's child's play. That, that may be one, one thing that God's holding it back for, for you know, to, because we don't, we don't even realize the degree to which things can really, really uh, get bad. Another thought, uh, let's turn to Revelation 3. We'll get to that one in a second, but before we get to that thought, while you're turning there, another thought that some have said, well, you know, why is he holding things back? And some have thought, well, maybe, maybe God is just, he's setting the table. He's setting the table with, with what is becoming more and more of a godless society. He's setting that table, uh, this godless society which takes pleasure in, right, in unrighteousness, th this godless society that that will come to the point to where God, as we see in 2 Thessalonians 2, Revelation 13, where, where God can send them strong delusion because they, they believed the lie. They took, they took pleasure in unrighteousness. You know, some have thought God's allowing this to build uh, and, and allowing the society here, the society around the world, to become more and more godless, to be prepared to to then receive that strong delusion, to be deceived by the lawless one, the coming son of perdition, uh, who will uh, give power to the end-time beast, you know, as, as we see uh, talked about in Revelation 13. We've, we've been instructed uh, all through our, our, our church history to keep an eye on Europe, keep an eye on the resurrection of that final, final uh, installment of the Holy Roman Empire, how many right now are really keeping an eye on Europe, on what's going on in Europe, and, and how that can, can come to fruition quickly? We've talked about this before, but you, you, you have uh, Europe is becoming more and more godless uh, to the point to where an individual uh, that, that comes out of that area, uh, if things get bad enough and you've got all the tables set with a more and more godless society that takes pleasure in unrighteousness, that has no baseline at all of, of God's way of life and what, what scripture is and all that, and you have an individual that can do these incredible things, and then boom, it's off to the races. It's off to the races. That power can come together very quickly, and here we go. Here we go. You know, maybe, maybe that's it. God is still setting that table. Let's look at another one, and this one is in Revelation 3, as you're there. Some have talked about this over the years. I've, I've, wondered, I've wondered this myself. Uh, where, where we are and what God is uh, allowing uh, and, and what he's holding back. Revelation 3, verse 8, as he talks about the church in Philadelphia, the messenger of the church, the angel of the church in Philadelphia writes, verse 8, I know your works, speaking to that congregation in that city. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For I have a little strength, for you have a little strength, and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Probably remember back, and we've, we've talked about this at different times, what is this open door? 
You know, what, what, what is this open door as, as we, as we uh, this, this group has an influence? Uh, we've often thought that that open door could, could mean the, the opening of the door of the gospel to get that message out, the effectiveness of that. Uh, and, and no one can shut it. Some look back on our recent church history and reflect on the, the efforts of uh, our previous uh, Pastor General, Mr. Herbert Armstrong, and the efforts that he uh, underwent with, with, with God's blessing, and, and to see the impact, uh, the spread or the coverage that he had through radio, later through TV, uh, through the literature that was distributed to where uh, you still have folks that you'll, you'll talk to that have been around a long time, that truck drivers that have that, that been on the roads, and you, you mention that name, and they say, well, yeah, I mean, I listen to him all the time. You, you couldn't not listen to him, uh, as they, they say, the kind of, kind of uh, coverage there. Some have thought with this open door that maybe prior to everything happening with the Great Tribulation being triggered and then and then all of the work that, that's done there through the two witnesses, some have thought, well, maybe, maybe God will, will open the door again, another, another open door that no one can shut for various reasons. God all of a sudden causes this door of the gospel to be proclaimed in a very powerful way to many people. Uh, the, the church, as, as you know, is, is constantly all about trying to get that gospel message out. Uh, in, a, in a financially uh, appropriate way to, to use that, to, to spread that gospel, but at the same time to look after the needs of the church, the, the two-pronged aspect of the gospel. But, but will there be an, a, another opening? Is, is that door opening? I mean, we have people that, that reach out to us that, that God calls through the, 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 uh, the vehicle of the various uh, gospel preaching methods that we have. Uh, but maybe there's going to be another, uh, another great open door, and, and we're, we're, uh, we may see that. But you look back at verse 7, and, and we also see other things that might be happening. Let's look at uh, verse 7 again. He says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these things, uh, these, these things says, He who is holy, who is true, and, and notice this, He who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts... And no one opens. You know, could, could it be that, that God is waiting for that time of when he is going to shut the door? If we're thinking about that in terms of, of, the, of the gospel message going out. That, that he will at some point shut that door. And nobody's going to open it. We, we have a mission, Matthew 24, 14, Matthew 28, 19, and 20, to preach the gospel, to, to uh, baptize uh, those, as you know, the, the, the passages. And we are all about doing that. But there may come a time that, that God shuts that door and no one can open. Uh, some, some have said, well, maybe that's happening now. Maybe now because of this lawlessness and all these things that are happening, that even though the, the, the information is out there, God is, in a sense, shutting a door right now before the great tribulation to where then the two witnesses are doing what they're doing. And then you've got, there at the very end, you've got an angel flying over the skies preaching the everlasting gospel. But you've, you've got some incredible things going. We've got a great multitude that comes out of the great tribulation. All, you know, the, the gospel is, is going to have an impact on people, uh, as we see in Scripture, uh, through the through that time period of, of the great tribulation leading up to the return of Christ. But could God be shutting the door? Some have, uh, have postulated or hypothesized, uh, are, are we moving into a time of the famine of the word? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I, I, I don't know if that's part of what's going on here. Look at verse 9. Indeed, he says, I will make those uh, of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, in, in a sense here, talking about those who are s saying they are followers of God, Jews in terms of, in a sense, spiritual Israel, of, of saying we're, we're part of the church, but they're really not, but lie. Indeed, I'll make them come and worship before your feet, these ones uh, who have a little strength and, who, and have, who have not denied God's name. He says, and, and to know that I love you because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. We read that passage 
And, and we see there that uh, we, we draw from that that there will, it, it appears that there will be a protection for some who have, have been diligent and have done these things in, in Revelation 3.10. Uh, be that they're protected by being taken to a place during that time period or being that they're kept from that hour of trial because they breathe their last breath and, and die and wait for the resurrection so quickly to come back uh, in newness of life as Jesus Christ's return. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no man may take your crown. Another thought that some have thought about. Why, why is God not, why are things not completely coming forward yet? It, what it's still, he, he seems to still be holding things back. Some have thought, well, could God be using this time to sift the church? Could he be using this time to, to allow him to see what we would call the Abraham factor? It, you know, the, the whole situation of, of Abraham's willingness to sacrifice Isaac. Now I know that you, Abraham, now I know that you fear God. Now I know that you fear God. And, and, and as, as he uh, continues in that passage, since you've not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Could, could God be using that with his church now to see who really does fear him? Who really does fear him? that they will uh, put nothing before God. Could be a combination of all these factors. Could be just a few. Could be something else. But I'm convicted of, of one reality in my life. God, for some reason, has chosen to draw me to him now. And he's done that to you. He's done that to each of us. My time of judgment is now. God's eyes are watching me <laughs> He's watching you now. Our time is now. His eyes were watching Abraham. What did he see with Abraham? What does he see as he looks at us? What is he saying to us as we go through each experience in our lives? You know that man, that young woman, that, that elderly lady, that, that youth, that, that teen, that, that child fears me. That child obeys me. That child loves me. That child follows me. That child behaves like me. That child views this world like I do. That child knows me. I know that regardless, uh, your time is now and my time is now, if God is truly calling you, if God is truly calling me. You know, we've got to keep our eyes open. We've got to keep our eyes open to what's going on in society, what's going on in Europe, as we said, what's going on in the world around us. But, boy, brethren, we've got to look here. We've got to look here right now. We've got to really see what's going on in here with each of us. The tribulation hasn't begun yet. You are not dead yet. I am not dead. We're alive. So we have some time. How much, we don't know. Why hasn't God allowed society to completely unravel yet, as we see in prophecy, as we've talked about, with all the things that are going to happen? We don't know, but we do know that each of us is here now, and we're still alive, and are we going to be found so doing? Are we going to be found so doing? Or as was talked about in the sermonette, are we distracted? Are we distracted? So many ways that we can become distracted to where what we're actually doing is thinking and doing a bunch, what, is, what amounts to a bunch of nothing spiritually. Uh, as I've mentioned before, I get lost in the late 60s and the 1970s, but there was a song by Simon and Garfunkel. Any Simon and Garfunkel people? Actually, we, we know some people who named their dog Garfunkel, Garf for short, but anyway, uh, Simon and Garfunkel. Uh, there was a song that they sang, uh, I think, Paul Simon wrote it. They've talked, I've seen some things that they've written at different times about uh, when they were young and, and just had these great ideals, and Paul uh, uh, Simon was the poet. But uh, there's a song that, that he wrote that was called Kathy's Song. Anybody know that song? Anyway, I'm going to sing since my wife's not here, but she's probably listening uh, on she better be listening, but anyway, I'm just going to sing a little bit and then I'll stop, but it's this part where he says, uh, well, it's all about Kathy, 
So his whole, his whole, the song is about this, this person's whole truth, this, whole, this person's whole reality is wrapped up in this woman. It uh, doesn't know anything else. Nothing else is really relevant except the truth of you, Kathy. So anyway, uh, again, not, not sound spiritually, of course, but, but he, makes, he makes a point uh, in, his, in, his, in his song. He says, uh, my mind's distracted and diffused. Remember that? My thoughts are many miles away. Anyway, that's, that's it. That's the singing. But my mind's distracted and diffused. Uh, I, I, uh, as I was thinking about Aaron's message and, and thinking about this, this, this whole thing of distraction and, and being diffused. Diffused is simply spreading out over a large area. It's not, it's not concentrated in a certain area. It's spread out. And, and we're seeing with everything going on, the distractions and the diffusing. The God of this world wants each of us here to be distracted and diffused. He wants our thoughts to be many miles away, not on the here and now and, what on, and on the, the reason for the here and now with perspective to what's, what's going to happen, the focus that's there. He employs many techniques to bring us to that state. Uh, if we're willing followers. But I'd like to just talk about one of these opportunities that Satan attempts to use as, they, as, they, as he attempts to seize or to gain a foothold in getting into our thoughts to help us become distracted and diffused. If he can do that, he can lead us down the path to destruction, which is his goal. It's one that, that I've realized has, has, has surfaced to some extent in my own life uh, these last three or four months due to a variety of uh, factors and experiences, uh, some COVID-19 related and, and the changes with that, but, uh, but it's one that I've, uh, I've come to, to realize is, is, is something that's, that's not, it's not bad in and in of, of itself, uh, but it has the potential in, in how we let this experience or this emotion we can either use it to channel it as a catalyst for tremendous spiritual growth, or we can use this emotion and this feeling to, to begin to destroy us spiritually. It's very dangerous territory spiritually to go down. And, and I'm talking about it today because I see it try to get into my own life. I see it trying to get into to God's people's lives as we see uh, the comments and things that go on out there uh, right now, even within the church. Some of the, the struggles that we're, we're seeing and the mindset of, of working together in unity and, and keeping our perspective where it needs to be. What am I describing? What am I describing? I'm describing disappointment. Disappointment. I mean, that's a basic concept. I think we all know what disappointment is. It's uh, a definition I found was uh, the feeling of sadness or displeasure caused by the defeat of one's hopes or expectations. Any, any of you had any disappointments uh, these last uh, several months? Uh, well, I think even if, as we look back in our lives, we can we can bring up very quickly to our memories various disappointments that we've experienced throughout our lives. But especially uh, during this time, the, the disappointments that have, have occurred, how do you cope or how do you deal with disappointments? How long do they stick in you? Uh, for me, again, emotional Andy here, uh, for, for me, it's, I can tell you where it is. When I, when I have a feeling of disappointment for, for could be any variety of reasons, but for me, this is very clinical here. It's like, it's like in the back part of my heart. Like if you go, you don't quite get to my backbone, but like between my backbone and my anterior portion of my heart, like right in there, it just kind of aches and it kind of spreads out over my whole body. Uh, maybe, it, maybe it starts in your right knee, but for me, it starts about right there uh, when, I, when I have this, this feeling of, of disappointment. And, and, and sometimes it, it really sticks, and it's hard to get rid of it. I, uh, you know, to this day, I can remember disappointments that I experienced as a child. Uh, that, that, and if I think about it much, it, it causes that place in my heart to start, start doing that again. It, and it gives me that, that feeling. Uh, these are small things, but uh, anyway, I, I'm doing this to give you a chance to reflect on 
some of those disappointments that you may have experienced in your life. Maybe some of the disappointments you're dealing with now, uh, d given uh, the, the, the extent to which things have happened, which to some degree may be completely out of your control. But uh, one was, I loved baseball so much as a kid. When I started, uh, my dad got me interested in the Cincinnati Reds and the Big Red Machine and, and all those players and getting my glove and... Uh, and, and my bats and, uh, that I would get when I'd go to the baseball uh, games on bat day, and then playing baseball uh, as a kid in Little League starting after my first grade year, I lived for the day when the baseball game would happen. Of course, uh, and we lived in, in Sabina, and they, uh, they, they dragged the field uh, uh, maybe once a year uh, there, it seemed like. Uh, so it, it was hard as a rock. So if it even started to sprinkle or, or threatened to sprinkle, it seemed like the, the baseball field all of a sudden was a lake. And there was, I, I would get so disappointed as I'd see the clouds rolling in there in Sabina and, no, no, it's not going to rain. It's not going to rain. Ah. And then I, I didn't get to play that game, and we didn't often get to do makeup games. I remember the, the sadness, the disappointment that I felt because I wasn't going to get to play in that baseball game because I looked forward to it so much. I remember uh, as I got older, I, I started enjoying golf, and golf was kind of a rich man's game when I was a kid. Uh, it was uh, a whopping $6.50 to play nine holes at, uh, at the Wilmington Golf Place uh, that was a, a, a hugely distant drive. Uh, nine miles away from our house, but my, uh, my buddy was uh, going to have his parents drive us there one Sunday uh, in the afternoon, and uh, prior to that, my parents, my, my dad had, had taken us shopping. He had to get some things all the way in Dayton, and it started to drizzle a little bit. And I remember thinking, well, you know, uh, golfers are, are, uh, are, are the kinds of folks where, you know, lightning could be striking 10 feet away from you, but it's, it's and, and you know, a, a toad strangler, a gully washer is, is coming down, and you think, well, I think this drizzle is going to let up. We should be able to play uh, as soon as this passes through. Uh, very, very optimistic, but it was, it was, a, it was a, a starting to get a little bit rainy, maybe a light drizzle, and my dad thought, there's no way you're going to play golf that day, and I was, look, I just remember this. I was looking so much forward to, to, to playing golf that uh, time went on, and my dad just didn't, didn't bring me back home, so Neil could pick me up and take me, take me golfing. And I was just getting more and more disappointed as I wasn't going to get that opportunity to, to, to play golf, which I rarely got to do. And sure enough, we got home, and it was drizzling a little bit, and it was way past time. And I just was so depressed, so disappointed in that, that I just decided I'm going to run, because I, I like to run a little bit. So I just started running. And, and I was still just so disappointed over the thing that I just said, I'm going to keep running. And uh, ran out through the, the country, countryside. And, and finally, uh, my, mother, my mother came on, on a bike. She was riding a bike and, and found me out there running still. And uh, she said, we thought you ran away. And I said, no, I was just running. But I ran 17 miles as, as a ninth grader and never run over eight miles uh, that day. But just, I just re remember that situation of, of not being able to, to let that, that frustration and that disappointment go. In high school, once my junior year, I could drive and you know, everything was always on Friday night. All the parties, anybody that had a party uh, locally, good friends of mine, you know, wasn't anything crazy going on, but just a party, get together with people. Uh, always on Friday night. Well, there was one on, on Saturday night, and I remember my dad wouldn't let me go as he didn't feel it was safe for me to be out on the roads that night. And I just, I just remember I was so disappointed that, that uh, this, the, the, these hopes or expectations were defeated. Uh, we've had some of that in the last few months. I think of our, of our graduates here. I was going to say their names, but I, I can't do that because we're on webcast. I didn't get permission ahead of time, but you know who you are. You know, I, I, think, of, I think of their situation, you know, all the normal things uh, that you would just take for granted that this happens with graduation. Not that, not that any of, of our individuals are thinking, well, this graduation's all about me. And it's not that. It's, it, you worked hard. You worked hard, and, and, and it marks a, a, a completion in your life as you're moving forward, and it's a, it's a, it's a great step to have completed. And, and 
so many of you have, have, have done so with, with tremendous honor, set a tremendous example in your, in your schools or, or in your, in your homeschool programs, the, the, the way that you prepared yourself to move forward. And, and then, then all of these things, I, I, I think of the, the, the high school athletes that were looking to their spring season, uh, their, last, their last season as, as seniors and, that are out there that, that uh, didn't get to have that. Folks that are battling career situations, job situations, businesses, uh, plans, vacations, trips, just, you know, I'm looking for my little break. I'm going to take that little vacation and, and catch the break, and you, you can't go anywhere. There's nowhere to go. The vacation doesn't happen. Summer camp, summer camp for folks. Uh, think of our preteens and our teens that that uh, many that, that really see that as a highlight of the year, to, to see uh, friends that they see once a year, and, and that, that didn't happen. Life changes all of a sudden because of these situations that have happened. In some cases, it's completely changed the direction of our lives. And then even, even more seriously, with, with some illness. We have folks here in our congregation that have, in this time, you know, dealt with illness, death of a loved one. And then, you know, you take that on beyond out, out from this. Uh, let's turn to Ecclesiastes 12, uh, to, to other, other countries who, who would say, well, again, that's, that's child's play. <laughs> that's child's play, the things that you're dealing with or the things that you mentioned here compared to what we're dealing with uh, in our country with, with starvation. Uh, but, but so many disappointments it can happen. So have I painted a picture of, about disappointment yet? Uh, I'm, I was hoping to do that. So as you've been listening and ruminating, can you uh, list those specific disappointments that you've experienced maybe in the last three months, say since March? Again, they, they don't necessarily have to be COVID-related. Uh, disappointment can be with our governmental leaders in various areas. Disappointment with the governmental system in place, the decisions that have been made. Disappointment over the way our lives have changed. Uh, the, you know, the, again, the, the, the situation of uh, maybe health, uh, deteriorating health. Things aren't getting any better. In fact, you know, in my situation, my life is worse. My health is worse. Uh, some are, are battling that. Uh, again, disappointment over the way our lives are changed, the, the plans, the hopes, the, 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 the things that we had planned to do even this summer, dashed. Disappointment uh, of, of not being able to get away and catch a break, uh, some rejuvenation time. Uh, disappointment with fellow members, seeing the different things that different people have said to you or, or the way others have let you down. Disappointment over a failed relationship that you were hopeful that it would uh, blossom into something wonderful maybe someday, dashed down, down the tubes, or, or, a, or a friendship, a failed friendship. Disappointment in your boss, maybe a, a boss, a, a, one of your employers, you expected better. Disappointment with yourself. Have any of you been disappointed in yourselves, as I have at different times uh, during this time? You know, folks that sometimes feel like I just can't get my life together. My life is one huge disappointment. I don't know if you've ever, ever felt that, but there, there are, are disappointments out there. But Ecclesiastes 12 speaks to the state that, that some get to. You've, you've read this before. It says, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1, Remember now your Creator in the days of your youth, before the difficult days come, the evil days come, and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. Have you ever been in, in that state where so disappointed with the situation at hand <laughs> of, of, what, of what you're dealing, or maybe a compilation of, of health situations to where, um, as the, the passage goes on to describe, uh, as we age because of these, this temporary life that we live, we, we're, we're, moving, we're moving towards that, to where if we live long, long enough, it, it can get, get to that point where we say, you know what, I have no pleasure in them. I have no pleasure in them. I'm not there. I'm not there yet. I just wanted you to know that. Uh, but, uh, but to sometimes have those fleeting thoughts of, of all of the things that we're facing, sometimes it can become overwhelming. 
So anyway, I would ask you this. How have you managed the disappointments? How have you managed the disappointments? What grade would you give yourself on each of those, on how you manage them? We're going to go through in the time remaining here today and, and look at a few techniques that, that I, I have found have helped me as, as I've gone through a bit of this myself in, in uh, the last several months of, of processing things and how, how do I manage these things, uh, of, of battling the, the, the mind being distracted and diffused through the, the ups and downs that we face in life, the disappointments. Let's look at uh, Romans 5. This is a, an incredible passage uh, that we cover with folks counseling for baptism. I think nearly every uh, pastor at, at some point has uh, uh, the, the person who is counseling go through various aspects of the, uh, the, the heart and soul here of Paul's letter to the Romans. But uh, Romans 5 uh, speaks to, to this first point, and we can't say it enough, but you know it, but it is so important as we deal with the disappointments that we face in life, uh, and it is simply to keep the big picture. We've got to keep the big picture. I, I, I know what the big picture is. I know it, and I try to think about it, but when the disappointments hit, in whatever area it is, it, I always have to actively re-engage my mind in the big picture. I've got to do it. I've got to do it because it just doesn't come, even though I know it. Uh, God wants us to actively engage our minds in the big picture at all times. And, and as we do that, as we do that, we can manage our disappointments. The disappointments Sometimes, depending on, on the way we're wired, uh, again, they affect us so viscerally that it can push out that big picture knowledge and understanding that we use to apply to, to help us keep our sanity. Uh, and, and some of us are different. Some of us, again, wear our emotions on our sleeves, as yours truly does. Some of us are more the analytical types, the thinking types. I'm processing this. I'm thinking this through. The emotion... Psh, but I'm hmm, thinking this, thinking this. But, but even, even you folks that are there, do you assume that pose? Do you do that when you think? But anyway, those of you that do that, when, you, when you're thinking, you also realize that, that folks that, that are in that way, the, the tendency is to continually process the way out of it. How can I get out of this? How can, how can I deal with this? This is a, this is a challenge, that, a disappointment that I, that I must work through and, and battle. And sometimes... Uh, those of us that are a little more analytical can get so lost in the churning of our minds in how to process that, that that overwhelms us. Does that make sense? Uh, so it, it, it depends. Even if we're more feeling or, or more thinking analytical, uh, the, we can get stuck in that and get so bogged down in the details of the issue that we can't get back out. So we've got to get back out and look at that. And, and we see that so clearly here. One of the things that we always talk about uh, with, with baptism uh, counselees is this understanding of justification. Justification is, is such a beautiful principle that God, that God puts here. It's, it's a principle that to many, in many respects doesn't make sense that it could actually happen, but, but it does. Uh, verse, verse 1, therefore, having been justified, having been declared righteous, God declares us righteous uh, by faith. You know, so our, our recognition of all of this, our, our belief and understanding of what has happened through the sacrifice of Christ, uh, that, that God actually looks at us and declares us righteous. It's, it's a miracle that, that, that that's happened. Uh, this is big picture stuff. Therefore, having been declared righteous by faith, as a result, we have peace. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also, also we have access. We have access by faith into this grace, this incredible favor, this incredible bestowing of, of, of kindness and care and concern and best interests at heart, all of this uh, 
this aspect that encompasses grace, we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. This is how we stand, and this is how we carry on in life and, and continue forward. And not only that, we rejoice in the hope, in hope of the glory of God. That, this is big picture material here. Verse 3, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, that stick to itiveness, that, that endurance factor to, to carry on. And, and in perseverance, character, this, this approved character that is, that is built in us uh, as, we, as we have that resolve, being in that status of, of being declared righteous with God and, and staying focused on that. Character and, and character, hope. Now there's the statement in verse 5. Now hope, with, with all of this in place, this kind of hope, this kind of big picture hope, it does not disappoint. It doesn't do it. Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit which was given to us. I mean, I, I sometimes just have to go back to that when I'm in my disappointed state and pull back and, and think actively about what's going on. I've got to stay there. I've got to stay there in that, in that kind of thinking. And, and as a result, it's okay. It's okay. We, I, I can get through the disappointing times, whether things have been done to me <laughs> that, that I had no control over or even when I've really messed things up myself and am trying to work through it. Uh, this, this is how God views us as, as we stay focused on that. It's, it's the whole Romans 8.28 deal uh, of working together uh, for good uh, uh, for those who are the called according to his purpose. We know that. Let's look at a second point. Psalm 30. Psalm 30. This is something that has helped me recently as well. Uh, there are times when uh, the, the disappointment uh, that we have is, is really unmerited. Maybe it's a, a selfish thing, and we realize, why am I so disappointed? Well, I'm, I'm disappointed because I'm really being selfish. I, I selfishly wanted this. So I'm not talking about these kinds of disappointments. I'm talking about the disappointments that are, uh, in, in a sense, legit uh, in terms of of when things have happened versus, uh, you know, something that is very selfishly motivated. But Psalm 30 uh, mentions in the latter part of the verse a concept that is, is so, so true in, uh, in, our, in our lives as we, and I've seen this play out over and over in my life on, on, a, on a grief at the time. The first part of the, the verse talks about as uh, God works with his people, if he, if he is a, in anger or of something, it's, it's, it goes quickly. It's but for a moment because God's favor is for life. And then he states this principle uh, that, that works for God's people. I've seen it work in, in my life with the various disappointments I've faced uh, throughout the day or, or uh, as the day has progressed. Verse, verse 5, mid, midway through Psalm 30, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. You had that happen? I just think sometimes, man, I am just so, so tapped out and, and disappointed over a situation. You know, you, you pray, you, you ask God to help, this and that, and, but then the morning comes and, all right, okay, all right, it's a new day. It's, it's like the passage in the New Testament where um, we're, we're renewed daily. And, I'm, and brethren, I'm not saying that there, there aren't some things that the grief is so severe. I think of, of some of the, the situations that, that brethren have endured, the loss of a loved one, uh, the, the, the devastations of divorce, uh, that it's not like, okay, I, I wake up the next day, oh, okay, I'm, I'm done, it's, it's all good, I can go forward now. These are things that take, grief is something that takes time, depending on the situation and depending on the individual. Grieving is an important part of, of working through disappointments. Uh, when, when the disappointments are, are legitimate disappointments, grieving is good. It, 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 it releases uh, some of the stress and the anxiety that, that has, has part of that. It's, it's part of the healing process. So I'm not striving to uh, shortchange the, the, the need for, for grieving. But I'll say this, this is point two. 
Grieve when you need to grieve over a disappointment, but, but don't remain there indefinitely because it can become a drug. It can become a very powerful drug uh, that there is a catharsis of, of remaining in a state of grief for uh, a long period of time. Some people will hold on to grief uh, and, 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 and not let that go, and that is their drug that somehow in a, in, a, in, a, in a skewed way gives them a sense of comfort instead of moving on. You get what I'm saying? Again, I am not minimizing the need to grieve. I'm not minimizing that. But, uh, but it's, it, is, uh, it is an important thing to have, but it, but it can, you, we must also realize that, that there's that hope aspect that we just read about in, in Romans 5. I want to spend time with this passage that is a story which I would be surprised if there's anyone here who doesn't know it well. Second Samuel, it's one of the, the most powerful examples of this uh, uh, in dealing with David's sins. But I, I want to go through this because I think sometimes individuals in, in looking at this passage can be a bit troubled. I know reading it on the surface, it, uh, to some degree, it, uh, it almost seems as if there is a flippancy at the end. And, and, and brethren, I do not believe that was the case at all with David. Uh, you know, we're going to read, uh, starting in verse 11, as Nathan begins to, to work with David in explaining what David did, uh, we're, we're going to get into some of the, the details of this. And, and I would ask each of us to, to really begin to think about the depth of disappointment that David had to feel uh, in, in, in this being made clear. Here's this individual that God has worked with so powerfully that has been so close to God and yet made some horrible choices. Can you, can you imagine, again, the depth of, of disappointment that David would have had to feel over his actions that led to the promiscuity of adultery, that led to him plotting the, the, the husband's death and, and, in a sense, by his actions, causing that murder to happen, directly, directly uh, culpable for that. And then the third one, to be responsible for an innocent child's death. Can you imagine the, the, the depth of disappointment, again, that David would have had to have experienced through that? Verse 11, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house, and I'll take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of his son. As, as, and that happened with Absalom. For you did all this secretly, David, but I will do this thing before all Israel, before the sun. And David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. I don't think we should take that statement that he said lightly. When Saul said it, he didn't say it with the, the conviction and the meaning behind it that David did. I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. David, you shall not die. However, because by this deed you've given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also who is born to you shall surely die. Then Nathan departed to his house. The Lord struck the child, verse 15, uh, that Uriah's wife bore to David, and it became ill. Now, and again, I don't want to get too, too graphic, but, but I, I think, you know, we, we realize what David did. David, David fasted and prayed. Uh, down on the ground for seven days. Do you think he did that uh, completely absent of that child? Do you think he was, the child was nowhere near him? Uh, I, I, would, I would not be surprised if, if he went in beside the child and, and prayed for him. I, I would not be surprised if he was in very close proximity as the child was going through the discomfort that the child was for seven days. And, and realizing more and more fully as he's pleading for God, please God, you are a merciful God, you can do this. And all the things that, that David may have said to God that he would be willing to do, uh, you know, again, for this child, if God just would mercifully look down upon him and, and change his mind in that respect, while that child is suffering for, for seven days, I, I just, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't something that was a little thing here. 
It, it, was, it was a major, major situation. As, as David is reflecting again on how could I have done this, the, the disappointment, uh, even though God put away the sin, the disappointment over his actions and, and the way that uh, he, he uh, pleaded to God. So as we know, uh, he pleaded with God for the child, verse 16, lay all night on the ground, went in and laid all night on the ground. So the elders of his house arose and went to him but to raise him up from the ground. He wouldn't. He didn't eat food. The seventh day it came to pass that the child died, verse 18. And the servants were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, indeed, while the child was alive, we spoke to him and, and he would not heed our voice. So what's going to happen if the child is dead? He may do some harm. Verse 19, so David saw that his servants were whispering. David perceived that the child was dead. So that's what he asked. And they said, he is dead. Verse 20, so David arose from the ground, washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes. And he went into the house of the Lord and worshiped. I think that we won't do this today, but I think a lot was going on here in verse 20. And we read that pretty quickly. But what, what David is doing here in this whole process of, 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 of recognizing what has happened and putting it in God's hands as God allowed this to happen and, and asking for God's forgiveness and, and moving forward in terms of, of saying, regardless of this, I am going to worship God. I am going to continue to strive to walk this path despite all that I had done. He went to his own house, and when he requested, they set food before him and ate. So then we come to this intriguing uh, statement here. Then his servants said to him, well, what is this that you've done? You fasted and wept for the child while he's alive, but now he's dead. And, and in a sense, you're not mourning. You're, you, why, why are you rising and eating food, and now he's dead? And he said, while the child was alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can tell whether the Lord may be, will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Why, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Sometimes we can read that and think David basically said, okay, this was God's decision. I'm going ahead. Uh, I, I really don't think that, that was what was happening. David, David realized the reality of the situation, and, and David experienced the 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 full-on, uh, 100% uh, disappointment over his actions. Uh, but he knew what had happened, and he knew he couldn't turn from that. So uh, did, did, does he just turn a page and go forward? Uh, I, I would submit to you that as as verse 11 says, Behold, I will raise up adversity against your own house, and I'll take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. And all the adversity that David experienced from then on out in, within his family and the uprisings and the, the different rebellions that he reflected. I, I, I think he, even though he, he knew that God had put that away, he reflected on that. And, and, and that, would, that would be with him. That would be a scar. That would be a scar of his actions. Uh, and, and it wasn't something that he just washed his hands clear of it and went on. It was a disappointment that, that he realized, I have to deal with this. I, I have to go forward. God does not want me to stop here and be stuck in the failure and the disappointment of this action the rest of my life. If I do then, I, then I, am, I am not allowing God to work with me to grow if I stay here. I cannot stay here. I've got to move forward. It's a very, very important point uh, for all of us. So uh, I think, again, uh, we, we've got to grieve, but at some point uh, we've, we've got to continue on. We've got to continue on. Matthew 11, Matthew 11 verse 28. Let's look there. Matthew 11. Verse 28, David knew, the Lord said to my Lord, he knew the, the throne of God and how that worked with the Messiah to come. He prophesied about the Messiah. Uh, I, I think of David doing just this, to be able to move forward. Uh, Christ said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. I can give you rest. 
Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's go to Proverbs 23. The next, the next thing that, that I've found for me that uh, has, has been helpful, uh, that I know there are many folks here that said, yeah, Burnett, I, I know this well. Uh, live my life dealing with this, and, and this, is, this has kept me sane. Uh, so many of you have been doing this. But Proverbs 23, uh, and, and the, the point is, is simply this. Be patient. Be patient. We've got to be patient as we deal with the disappointments of life. We've got to wait on God when we're stuck. When we're stuck in a disappointing situation. Have you been in that situation before where you just realize, I am stuck. I am trying to help here. I'm trying to do this here. I'm trying to do this here. But the circumstances are such, it's such a disappointing situation that, that there's nothing else I can do. I've, I've tried to do this and this, but, uh, but I'm just stuck here right now. Uh, so, so be patient. Wait on God when you're stuck in disappointing situations like that and, and want to fold or collapse and just simply keep obeying him. <laughs> Just, it's so basic, but be patient, wait on God, and whatever I do, I am going to keep obeying him. Uh, and sometimes that's all we can focus on sometimes in that is I've got to think clearly, I've got to think right, uh, I, I've got to obey God. I, I can't get out of this situation, I'm very frustrated by it, but follow God. Proverbs 23, verse 17. Proverbs 23, verse 17. Don't let your heart envy sinners, but be zealous for the fear of the Lord. This, this zealous for zealousness, zeal for, for serving God fully, for reverencing Him. And I've got to stay focused on that. Be zealous for the fear of the Lord all the day. Because he says, for surely there is a hereafter, and your hope's not going to be cut off. Sometimes that, that's all we can do when viscerally the dis disappointment is, is, is so full on. Uh, I've got to focus on fearing the Lord, following him, obey, stay in the mode, stay in the mode. At the end time, uh, we see uh, this being a factor as well, this being patient, waiting on God when we're stuck, a situation in which we can't... Uh, extricate ourselves uh, and we feel the ability to collapse if we're not strong but just simply keep obeying him it's in Luke 21 it's actually in one of the Olivet prophecies I like the way that uh, Luke records uh, Christ's words in this uh, slightly uh, slightly different uh, area that that he draws out here of, of Christ's words when he gave the Olivet prophecy Let's, let's look at uh, Luke 21, verse 12. Speaking of the end time and, and the challenges that, that God's people would, would face, Luke 21, verse 12. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You'll be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake, but it, but it will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. It's, God actually can use that for a very, very powerful tool as we allow him. Therefore, settle it in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer. Uh, it'll be okay. I'll give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. Notice verse 16. You're going to be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends. Anybody been in that situation in, in your lives uh, where, where, that's, where that's happened? It's very, very painful. It's extremely disappointing when those closest to us uh, do these things that, that create betrayal. Very, very painful. And, and speaking of painful, <laughs> they will put some of you to death. Some, some will die as a result of that. And you'll be hated by all for my name's sake. But not a hair of your head shall be lost. Well, does that mean that... Uh, we won't die? Well, no, it's not, not saying that because verse 16 says, and they will put some of you to death. So uh, we've often thought that this verse 18 is, is speaking more of, of God keeping us, in a sense, for the resurrection. We, we Very precious to him. Not a hair of your head will be lost. Uh, again, not that uh, he's protecting every single hair uh, 
uh, that is, is quickly leaving this area of my scalp at, at this point. Uh, it, dealing with our, our, our future. God, God, every hair of our head is numbered. God knows uh, what he has in store for us. We, we won't be lost in that respect. And then look at verse 19. By your patience, possess your souls. Be patient. Wait on God when you're stuck in these impossible situations. Do what he says. Keep obeying him. And by your patience, possess your souls. The NIV uh, renders it, by standing firm, you will gain life. Okay, we'll look at the fourth point. We've got two more. Uh, Psalm 77 is a good passage to read uh, with respect to that. I, I go to Psalm 77 sometimes as, as I feel stuck. Uh, you can read that if you like. This four, fourth uh, point is one that uh, it especially concerns me now with God's people. In, in where we are right now as a church, where we are in terms of... Uh, you know, what's, what's trending <laughs> right now in the church? Uh, some, some areas that, that I see that, that give me concern over with, with the, the spiritual organism of the church. I'm not saying that this is widespread, but I see it rearing its, its ugly head. And I sometimes see it trying to rear its ugly head in my life. So, so I want to talk about it. Uh, when we deal with disappointment in individuals disappointment in our own lives, but, but especially these uh, decisions that, that are made by various individuals, um, we've got to stay away from the danger zones, okay? We've got to stay away from the danger zones that disappointment in these kinds of situations can cause us to enter. We're all different, and we all have a, an ability to fall into these destructive behaviors that, that we can get into that, in a sense, medicate the pain or medicate the disappointment that we've, we've felt over hurts from others, uh, disappointments in those individuals, and even disappointments in our own lives that aren't caused by others. But we can move into destructive behaviors that medicate that, uh, uh, to medicate that. Uh, again, you know what those destructive behaviors are for you. I know what they are for me. I know what they are, and, I, and, what, and what I've got to steer away from. I know that it, it could be a mindset that I allow myself to get into of, oh, well, this is so heavy. My life is, you know, all these things are so weighing down on me and then get into that and stay in it. Uh, you know, it can be anything from a mindset to actual behaviors that are, that are destructive. Uh, Disappointments, uh, disappointing situations, all these things uh, can, can lead to, and this is what especially concerns me right now with, with some of the things that I see going on with, with all the different things that we, we see happening out there, the, as Mr. Greider mentioned, the distractions and the, the confusion that's out there. We see folks <clears throat> all of a sudden leading those disappointing situations, turning that to, to anger, to to, to placing blame, to, to lashing out at others. And, and I see that going on uh, within the church, this frustration that builds up in, in the lashing out. You know, think about the Israelites. Okay, the Israelites, here they were delivered by God. They come out of, of Egypt. They go through the Red Sea, tremendous deliverance. And then, you know, they start to experience some disappointment. Well, well we still have a way, a way to go here to get to the promised land. Oh, we don't have water. I don't know how many expected that, that here we're, we're coming out with, with animals and all these things and, and the, the precious things of Egypt, and we're going, and now all of a sudden we don't have water to drink. And we need water to drink or we're going to bite the dust. I'm really thirsty. And, and, and how, how are we going to go forward with this? And, and what ended up happening? Okay, this, this, is, this is a test. I need to stay calm and stay focused on God and in his ways. He'll look out for me. What, did that, is that what happened? <laughs> is, is that what happened? Uh, no, they lashed out. Moses, what are you doing? You bring us out here? What, what God, God's going to just, this, this God that we serve, Moses, you're bringing us out here for, so we can die? Get us back to Egypt. How come you did this? The disappointment turns and focuses at an individual and blame is placed there. And it's cathartic. It feels good. It feels good to be able to, to channel that hurt and frustration and, and disappointment at something. Uh, and, and it's really misplaced instead of coming back here. What, what's really going on in here? What's really going on in, in what I'm allowing 
Satan to do in my life versus what I could be allowing God to do in my life as I follow, as I follow these steps. You know, we, we see, we see uh, you know, uh, you got the other example of the situation with, with uh, going into the land of Canaan and getting ready to do. They come back, this is great land, but these giants, well, God never told us about these giants that are going to smash us like grasshoppers. How can you do this to us? Here, we're stuck here. This is very disappointing to know that giants are going to wipe us out with their clubs, you know, or, or, or with, uh, break us like the twig that we are, or whatever, whatever you want to say, because we're so tiny. Uh, how can you do this to us? And then, boom, let's, let's, we got to stone somebody. Let's stone Moses. Let's stone Caleb. Let's stone Joshua. Kill him. This is so disappointing. Uh, we, we, do, we can do that as a church. We, we see that going on out there, this, this turning and this, all of my frustration and anger goes right at, at, at certain individuals. Uh, you know, the different races and different, different nationalities have different characteristics. What, what, is the, what, is the, what are the characteristics of Israelites? This is a melting pot of people, but we, we, are, the, we, are, we are Manasseh. What, what, are the, what are the characteristics of Israelites? Stiff-necked and rebellious. <laughs> we, we get that way. I get that. I get, I get stiff-necked on things. And you want to be rebellious and lash out. Uh, that's something that, that we can do. And, uh, and we, must, we must fight that. We must fight that and stay away from the danger zones that disappointment can cause us to, to enter. Because if we give way to that, then we begin to allow certain things to take us down a path that Satan grabs a hold of. He'll get us any way we can. Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Matthew 24, verse 4, as we, as we read this, this Olivet prophecy. Some of you were ahead of me on this. But this, this is, is my concern of, of, of where uh, I, I see with the generations uh, here in, in the church, in, in, our, in the spiritual organism of the church, the, the things that are under, uh, under, the, under the surface that could be bubbling if we allow it uh, for, for any of us at any age, these are here. L look at all these things that we see. We won't read through them, but look at all the things through verses 5 uh, through 9. We, we know these. These are things that we see happening now. We see things that are getting worse and worse and and, and these things cause disappointment. Then we, so we come then to this, this result of that that we know well here, verse 10, then many will be offended. I'm offended. I'm outraged at this. How could this person say this or do this? I'm outraged. I, you know, and then, then we go on a, on a tirade. Offenses, betraying one another, hating one another. False prophets out there teaching different things. False teachers deceiving folks. And as we see all this, as Mr. Greider mentioned, the lawlessness, the confusion, everything that's around, the church sees that. And, and I can just see the love of many waxing cold. The love of many growing cold. I'm sick of this. I'm sick of messing with it. I'm sick of dealing with this frustration and this frustration with this person and that and all this. I'm just stepping back. I'm just stepping back. Uh, forget this uh, whole uh, concept of bearing with one another in love. Where, where has that gotten me? <laughs> you know, as, as we see the, the challenges that are out there and the, the conflicts that are there. But, but again, I, I would say to you this, God knows who are his, and God is watching you and me. He, he wants to see how, how we approach life, how we view things how we deal with disappointments that we see going around us, and can we stay focused and driving in a way that is godly so that we don't allow ourselves to get into that, I, I'm just, I'm done, I, I'm apathetic towards all of it, and, and allow that coldness to, to come in. God wants us on fire for, for what's, what's going on versus this. I'm so disappointed with this person's decision that this individual could take this position. And I'm done with all of it. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. You know, it takes work. It takes hard work, as we know. Uh, it takes God's spirit to bear with one another in love while speaking the truth in love. I'm concerned for the church in this area as time goes on. 
It's easy to turn our frustrations and disappointments towards someone or towards something. I've seen it happen. You've seen it happen. A person is hurting, deeply disappointed in his actions or, or her actions or somebody else's, and, and then all of a sudden they, they can focus it on this individual or this situation and cause all of that anger and blame to go towards that, and they feel better, and they haven't taken care of what's here. Does that get you sometimes? Do you allow that to happen? Can I allow that to happen? Yes, yes. Uh, and, and it can be fueled, and it can be fed, and it can be disastrous. Don't let it happen. And I am, I am confident that God's people, those who are truly his, will not let that happen. Final point, one that we know well, let's turn finally to Psalm 34. This is something that's helped me as well, uh, that I strive to do continually. Again, uh, not, not a surprise here, but simply remain thankful. Note the blessings. Note the blessings and the lessons learned along the way. Stay thankful. Stay thankful. See those blessings. I, I see that uh, that's one of the neat things of this whole situation that I, I thought has been really neat in talking with brethren. I look forward to talking with more brethren about that. It seems like nearly every member that, that I talk to at some point can talk about the blessing that's been in the, the challenges that we've faced uh, most recently. Um, I'll get there in a second. Psalm 34 as we wrap this up. You know, I think of one family here recently that had a horrible situation happen at their house that uh, was going to cost thousands of dollars uh, to take care of, and they simply didn't have the money. Uh, and they've had a variety of other health issues and things that I just have felt like they've had almost too much to bear. And then all of a sudden, uh, they called me uh, this week and said, you know, we were talking to a nurse that came uh, to our house to, to help with a health situation, and she said, you know what, I know of a governmental plan that could take care of this situation that you have at your house. Thousands of dollars, a couple of calls, a couple of paperwork, and boom, it's taken care of. You know, they all of a sudden, you know, said, huge blessing uh, for that family. The blessing of, of uh, as, as you know, the the couple in our congregation uh, where the, the wife is, is battling cancer right now. And uh, you know what they've said, the, the blessing of being home. Here, here she's battling cancer. She's gone through chemo treatments. It's been uh, very painful and disorienting and, and, and cloudy in, in getting through it with all the nausea. But the blessing of being able to be home during this time and the family there with her, because of, uh, because of the COVID situation, they're all able to be there and, and surround uh, her to help her through that. The, the blessing of having time to reflect, the blessing of being able to be given an opportunity to realize through some of these things that have happened recently, the clearer realization of what's truly important in life. The blessing of, of, of a clearer understanding that there is nothing that we can do in this world to fix this mess. It's so clear to me, it's even clearer than it's ever been, that we can't fix this mess. These, these issues are spiritual in nature. Uh, please, God, send back your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. An opportunity for us not only to survive, but to thrive during these, these changing times that God's given us. And as, uh, as much as I hate public speaking, the blessing of not having to wear a mask when I'm talking to you uh, here today. That, that is, that is the, the, little, the little blessing uh, that, that I'm receiving today. So let's uh, turn finally to Psalm 34. Think, think about these things, but uh, as, as, we, as we wrap things up today, as, as we deal with the disappointments now and the disappointments that will come, God will get us through them. Finally, Psalm 34. He says here, David says here, I'll bless the Lord at all times. I'm going to bless him. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the eternal and he heard me. He delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant and their faces were not ashamed. The poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want, there is no, oh, no lack to those who fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord 
shall not lack any good thing. And I have uh, striven to pull back and think deeply about that. Anything that is truly good, truly good, I, I've, I've come to realize, you know what? I don't lack in that. I don't lack. I don't lack because of what God has done for us. I don't lack in anything that is, is really a good thing. Come, you children, listen to me. I'll teach you the fear of the Lord. Who's the man who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Here's this thing of obedience. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace. Pursue it. The eyes of the Lord, God is watching. Judgment is a good thing as he watches his people. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. He's watching us, and he's there for us. He's waiting for us to continue to stay close to him and ready to intervene for us. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears. He delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He guards all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Evil will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous shall be condemned or held guilty. Verse 22, the Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those, none of those who trust in him shall be condemned.